Well, I think this morning we're going to, because we have communion, we're going to jump right into the message. So, um, you know, as I've mentioned every week, there are basic themes and key words and characteristics in every book. And the thing, and, and one of the things that's essential in Bible study is to identify these things and characteristics, and that's why I go over them every week. Um, the key words for Acts are Holy Spirit and Church. The theme of Acts is the history and development of the early church. And um, the scope of the book goes from the ascension of Christ to Paul's imprisonment in Rome. And remember, this is a transition book. In the beginning, the early church was by and large Jewish. And so there was a difficult transition that had to be made in the mind of the Jew. And many of the things that happen in Acts never happen again as part of that transition. And because of this, Acts is not a book from which we would develop doctrine. And as I said before, this, however, in no way takes away from the value of the book. Uh, today we're moving into uh, that part of Acts that examines Paul's life after his third missionary journey. And uh, look at the statement that Paul made as he journeyed home at this time in Acts 20, 22, and 23. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, knowing that the things that will happen, uh, knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying, that chains and tribulations await me. So Paul had an intense desire, an intense love to, to reach his people, and he looked for every opportunity to, uh, to win them to Christ. And uh, this was on his mind as he's going back toward Jerusalem. And as he was going, he knew that chains and tribulations were in his future. The Holy Spirit had warned him about that. All through the return trip, uh, this, uh, thir from this third missionary journey, he continued to be warned through faithful friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. And in Acts um, 21, 11 through 12, it says, that, And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the, the hands of the Gentiles. And now when we heard these things, both we and those uh, from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, isn't it interesting that uh, we as believers will sometimes try to discourage people from doing what they're convinced God would have them do? That happened to Janet and I when we were getting ready to go to Indonesia. And I had someone come up to me and said, oh, you're going into missionary work. And I said, yeah, well, there's not a lot of money in that. He said, he had no idea. <laughs> And I've often thought it would be nice to have DJ and Tricia here in the States all the time instead of them going back to Africa. They would be safer here, wouldn't they? Or would they? Would they be safer here than there? And is it, is, it is true that uh, there's a cost to be counted when we serve God. But as long as God has something for the believer, I think that believer is bulletproof. When you are in God's will, nothing can come into your life outside of God's plan for you. But Paul was heading into some serious suffering. And um, God, the Holy Spirit, made him aware of this. And in our humanness, we think it would have been better for him, knowing what was ahead, if you just avoid going back to Jerusalem. And isn't it God's will for the believer to live a comfortable life? Well, some people think so, and some Christian leaders even teach that. 
And yet, here we have Paul continuing to go toward Jerusalem, even though many of his friends have warned him against it and begged him not to go. And in Acts 20, 24, and it says, But none of these things move me. This is Paul speaking, of course. Nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul had uh, something he wanted to do in Jerusalem, and he, he was motivated by his love for his people. He had made three missionary journeys, planting churches in areas where, that were predominantly Gentile. And yet in each town, he always started by trying to reach the Jewish community. Now the Gentiles were the focus of his ministry, but he, he grieved that his own people had for the most part rejected their Messiah. And I believe Paul wanted to make another effort to reach his own people, and he believed that the best place to do that would be the temple in Jerusalem. And I'm going to take the liberty to jump ahead for a few verses here and to Acts 21, 15 through 17. It says, And after those days we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain Manasseh of Cyprus and a, 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 an early disciple with whom we were to, to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. So when Paul arrived in Jerusalem, he was received by his brothers in Christ. And in Acts 21, 18 and 19, it says, And on the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And when he had greeted him, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And again, we see that Paul held himself accountable to the leaders of the church, reporting to the elders in Jerusalem. Now, Paul was able to give them an update of the churches that had been established in Asia and Eastern Europe. And in Acts 21, 20 through 21, it says, And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. Now, I want to keep that in mind. But they have been informed about you that you teach all Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. Now this is a difficult piece of scripture to understand, all the more when you put Paul's writing in their chronological order. Paul had already written the books of Romans and Galatians at this time, and in these two letters, he made it clear that as believers, we are no longer under the law. It is true that we never see him demand that Jewish believers renounce the law, but we do see him make it very clear that the law could not function as a means of salvation. So the Jewish believer was in a to this Jewish believers, this was a, a very difficult transition to make. And now here in Jerusalem, Paul is being asked by James, one of the leaders in the Jerusalem church, to go along with this little scheme that he had come up with. I don't think James had as of yet seen that there would have to be a break from the old traditional ways of Judaism. In fact, James's plan was to put Paul in good standing with those believers who wanted to see Christianity as just another sect of Judaism. And he was trying to do a little religious politicking, and we see that Paul is swayed in this and actually goes along with it. We also need to recognize that this was a moral failure for Paul. He should never have gone along with, with James's scheme. But he failed because of his love for his Jewish brothers and sisters, those of his, his nation. And in Acts 21, 
22 through 24 says, what then? The assembly must certainly meet and they will hear that you have come and therefore do what I tell you. And this is James speaking. We have four men who have taken a vow, take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may also shave their heads and that all may know that those things which they were informed concerning you are nothing but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. Now James was asking Paul to make the same compromise that many of the other Jews were making at this time. And again, I want to stress that this was a very difficult time in the history of the church. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, was a Jew, and as a Jew, he embraced Jewish tradition. But the Gentiles were starting to, to join the church in increasing numbers, and these Gentiles were not expected to keep the Jewish law. Now, some Jews embraced Christianity and attempted at the same time to remain true to the law and to all that went along with Judaism. Now, I think it's interesting that we have many Christians trying to do that today. That, of course, uh, is a result of them not knowing their Bibles. But now James continues with his explanation here in Acts 21-25. But certain of the Gentiles who believe we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood and from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. So James acknowledges that they do not expect the Gentiles to conform to Judaism. So in reality, he's suggesting that they have different expectations for the Christian Jews than that for the believing Gentiles. Is this what God wanted? Did he want for the church a Jewish segment that followed Judaism and a Gentile segment that did not? Basically two different churches. Well, look at Ephesians 2.14. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So, this middle wall is this here, because it's this being the, gent the court of the Gentiles, where they sold the sheep and all that, you know, that Jesus drove out the money changers. That was this, this area right here. The Gentiles weren't allowed past these walls. And this is where, the, of course, this is the Holy of Holies, and this is where the rest of the temple was, the temple proper. Is that what, is God just continuing on with this picture? Well, race and national distinction vanish in Christ. The foot of the cross is level ground. This idea of separating Jew and Gentile believers had come up in the past. And Paul had already confronted it in Galatians uh, 2, 11 through 13. It says, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision or those Jews. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. So Paul had already confronted this separation issue and now we see him falling into the same trap. And remember, Judaism was their whole identity. It was much more than a nationality. It was their customs and cultures. It was everything that with him, it was their family. In that day, if you were to say that someone was a Roman, that person could be any of a dozen nationalities, languages, or cultures. But if you said he was a Jew, there was no question about how he thought and what his background was. Paul was a Jew. And as a Christian, he must have occasionally suffered an identity crisis. 
But let's briefly review Paul's teaching and the accusations that were made to get a clear picture of what's happening here. To do that, we have to look again at Acts 21, 20 through 21. And when they had heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. Now the accusation against Paul was twofold. They have to do with the law of Moses and the customs of the Jews. Well, let's look at the, the easiest one first. Saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor walk according to the customs. Was Paul preaching that the, the, the teaching the believers that uh, that they did not have to walk according to the customs and traditions of the Jews? Well, actually he was. Remember, the traditions are different from the Jewish scriptures of the Old Testament. What Paul taught in regard to the customs was no different than what Jesus taught. In Mark 7, 8, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. And also look at Galatians 4, 9 through 11. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements, referring to the traditions, to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years, I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. The Jews elevated their traditions above the word of God, and Paul taught against that. So this accusation that was made against him was correct. Well, how about the second accusation? They have been informed about you that you teach the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Was Paul also teaching that the Jewish believers were no longer under the law? Absolutely. I think we'll find that this accusation was also true. We have people today that are very confused over this issue. There are believers who think that if they could get our society to operate under the Ten Commandments, we would have a righteous society. Would we? How many of you never, ever go above the speed limit? I mean, if it's written down, it's a law. You have to obey it. Well, the Ten Commandments are also called the Law of Moses or just the law. What is the purpose of the law? Were the Ten Commandments given to enforce holiness? That's the big question. Remember, Paul had already written Romans and Galatians at this time. He, he wrote Romans and Galatians a couple years before this incident happened. So in, that's why you need to keep things in their chronological order. He was very clear on the purpose of the law in Galatians. In Galatians 3, 20, 2 through 25, it says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So let's look closely at this. The law was our tutor. It does not remain our tutor. A tutor is just another way of saying teacher. But after faith, or after we have come to Christ, we no longer have need of the law. We now have the Holy Spirit. And in John 16, 13, it says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So, and this is Christ's words, of course, he said, there's going to come a time when you, I will give you the Holy Spirit and he will guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth <clears throat> and through him 
We are to walk as sons of God. The Ten Commandments are terrific. And they're terrific to see posted at, in our, our courthouses, which they used to all be there. It's an appropriate place for them because they remind people of how far they're removed from the righteousness of God. But these Ten Commandments <clears throat> are really not part of your walk. In Romans 6, 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Well, what does it mean by dominion? Well, let's look at a different translation. The New American Standard Bible says it this way, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, it's important to recognize that as believers, <clears throat> who are not under law, they're not dominated or mastered by sin. The dominion is due to their effort to live according to the law. The focus in life, if you're trying to live according to the law, your focus is always going to be, well, did, was that a sin? Did I sin there? And you're, you're, there's no freedom under the law, just further bondage. It's like this. <clears throat> I have the Holy Spirit in my life. I'm not living under the law as a believer. And let's say I get up in the morning And Janet burns the eggs. And I say, you know, I've told you and told you I like my eggs a certain way. Now, you should be able to at least cook eggs. Well, have I sinned according to the law? No. I have not sinned according to the law. But is God pleased with the way I am acting as his child? Absolutely not. I'm, I don't have to worry about the law. I have the Holy Spirit in my life. And as soon as I turn away, the Holy Spirit says, eh, why did you do that? And in responding to him, I give it, Janet, would you please forgive me? Forgive me for talking to you the way I talk to you. As a believer, I am not under the law. I'm under grace. The law is completely different. But sin, sin in that way, sin does not have dominion over the believer who is under grace because his focus is on Christ. And the Spirit of God, my focus is on complete, something completely different. I don't go around with uh, to Ten Commandments in my head. Okay, did I blow it this time? No, I just walk with God. If you're attempting to live your life by the law, I'll tell you already, you are a discouraged and beaten believer. God never designed the law to produce righteousness in man. The law was there to condemn man. It's not there to produce righteousness in man. How then is righteousness produced? If we are not to live, aren't we to live holy lives? Well, look at Romans 8.3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. The law was never, will never give you a victorious Christian life. It will never give you an abundant or joyful life. It's too weak. Victory over sin and fulfillment in life only comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's not possible if you're still under the Mosaic law. Under the law, your focus is on sin. And grace, your focus is on Christ. Under law, your focus is on 
everything I've done wrong under grace. My focus is on that one person, that one individual who is, who if, if stands before the accuser, and let's say I blow it in a big way, and, all, and Satan stands before God, and he see him, that Morrison character, see what he's done now? And Jesus stands before him, and he says, he's mine. I paid for that. You leave him alone. He's my intercessor. Under grace, I understand that. As a matter of fact, if you're attempting to live your life by the Ten Commandments, you're slapping the face of the Holy Spirit. You're saying, I don't need you or want you in my life. I got this down. If you're doing that, I can tell you right now that your life and your home does not reflect the joy and contentment that God desires for you. Well, let's get back to Acts. I'm getting carried away here. Paul had already written these instructions to believers in Rome and Galatia. James is trying to get him to return to his roots in Judaism. We find Paul is on a bit of a slippery slope here. At this time, he's about to participate in a scheme devised by James. And in Acts 21, 26, it says, Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, he entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. To go through this would require Paul to make a sin offering. He knew that the sacrifices were unnecessary because the sacrifices were a picture of the coming Christ. Paul needed no sacrifice for sin. He had Christ, the sin bearer, who had died on his behalf at Calvary. And in Acts 21, 27 through 29, it says, And now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen a Trophimus, an Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed Paul had brought into the temple. So the Jews themselves prevented Paul from going on with this. But what would have happened if Paul would have continued? By stepping up to the altar and offering an animal sacrifice, it would have been a virtual denial of the one true sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews 10, 1 and 2, it says, For the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect for then would they have ceased to be offered for the worshipers once purified would have no more consciousness of sin but if you read the rest of Romans 10 Paul goes on to explain when well, I believe it's Paul all about the sacrifices and then in Romans 10, 12, it says, But this man, Jesus, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Hebrews was written five or six years after this crisis time in Paul's life. And most Bible scholars believe that Hebrews was written by Paul. And if it was written by him, and I believe it was, it's, only, it's the only letter that, where he doesn't identify himself as, a believe, as the author. But even though he did not identify himself, the style and terminology are Paul's. And Paul thoroughly understood the value of the sacrifices and why they were no longer important. But let's look again at Acts 21, 27 through 29. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel! Help, this is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he has brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. 
Now we know that Paul was, did not bring any non-Jews into the temple. He would not have tried to provoke those he was wanting to reach. The other accusations about him teaching against the Jews, the law, and the temple were probably true from a Jewish perspective, but actually he wasn't necessarily teaching against anything. He was teaching that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And remember what I said about repentance uh, before. Repentance is not penance. It's not trying to, to in some way make up for a wrong thing done in the past. Re repentance is judging yourself in the presence of God and upon seeing the truth of your condition turning to God. Now this happens to every person that comes to a right relationship with his creator. The Jews that, that Paul had led to Christ had repented and they had judged themselves in the light of God's provision for mankind, Jesus Christ, and comparing Christ with Judaism had revealed that Judaism by itself could not make them right with God. And in repentance, they were turning from the law, the customs and traditions of the Jews, and turning to the Savior. Now when Paul spoke to the Jews, he explained that the customs and traditions did not make a person right with God. And Paul's message is what had been communicated to the Jews in Jerusalem. And that message, along with the fact that Paul had been preaching to the Gentiles, which also agitated the Jews, had stirred them up to this point. But Paul was only doing what Jesus had taught in reaching out to both Jews and Gentiles, because Jesus said this in John 10, 16. Other she and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, and them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So that wall of partition, which some of the, the Jewish Christians, James included, were trying to uphold, was never to be part of the church. But knowledge of Paul's teaching the Gentiles, accompanied with his being seen with Trophimus earlier, led the Jews to believe that Paul had defiled the temple by bringing Greeks or, or non-Jews into it. So the Jews grabbed Paul, and he was not able to go ahead with James' scheme. And in Acts 21.30, it says, And all the city was distur uh, disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now, what I believe we see here is God's intervention in Paul's behalf. God overruled James and his plan to place Paul on a peaceful footing with the Jews of Jerusalem. Instead, the whole city stirred, was stirred up over Paul's appearance in the temple. And they not only threw Paul out of the temple, but they shut the doors after him. And in Acts 21, 31, and 32, it says, Now, as they were seeking to kill him, News came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, and he immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the commander and soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Now, now that the Jews had a, a hold of Paul, they were not going to they were going to get rid of him for good. And Paul, uh, they weren't going to let him get away. Paul may have slipped up here, but that didn't mean that God was going to abandon him. And I'm sure that God does not deal with us the way most people think he does. Many believers see God as that cosmic policeman I've mentioned before that's ready to whack you with his nightstick the moment you step out of line. God never gives that picture of himself. He always presents himself as the loving father, the good shepherd, and the friend of sinners. In this case... God sent Roman soldiers to rescue Paul. And in Acts 21, 33 through 36, it says, And the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and, and some another. So when he could not 
ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken to the barracks. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after crying out away with him. Now remember, Paul was warned about going to Jerusalem. Let's look again at 20, 22, and 23. And see now, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. What happened to Paul was exactly what the Holy Spirit had warned him about. And again, I believe that there are some very important lessons for us to learn here. First, that people, the people that God uses and used to write the Bible are no different than you and I. They were people that messed up sometimes. And James messed up here, and so did Paul. None of us are above getting off track. And second, that God never abandons us. Because of Paul's little identity crisis here, he took, we took time to review, a, again, law and grace, which is very important for us as believers to understand. This is part of the whole counsel of God and what he has provided for us in salvation. It is a life that is free from the bondage of, of sin. And that type of life is not available to you and I if we're making an effort constantly to keep the law. That places us back under bondage. The rich life that Paul spoke about is that life available through the grace of God. Believers who live under the law are dominated or mastered by sin. You can see them. You can see these guys a mile away. They have this list of rules always on the wall and they're trying to apply that to themselves and to you and so you better wear your hair just right you can't wear pastel colors if you're a man and you better you you better do everything just according to that list of rules the only problem is we're not under the list of rules we have the word of god and we have the spirit of god that guides us into truth if you're going to put yourself under the law, you're going to probably drive your children away from church. They're not going to want any part of this legalistic mess that we often call Christianity. We don't want to put people under the law. We live according to grace, and that grace will guide us into all truth, and it gives you a free, a freeing life. You're just... Um, a believer who walks with God has tremendous freedom. There is no freedom under the law, just further bondage. But sin does not have dominion over the believer who is under grace. And as I said, it can affect your whole family. But I better quit because we have to do communion. So 